The photography journey was a little, uh, I don't know, it kind of surprised me, I think. It was never something that I planned to do. It was something that uh, a friend of mine was a good photographer and I went on traveling with her. I went to India um, and I thought I would take a camera with me and I inherited my brother's big Russian Zenit camera, it's like 35 millimeter camera. Um, and I carried that around with me in India the whole time and took terrible photos. Um, but my friend who had a, like a newer DSLR, um, she was just great at it and she just was taking these photos that I saw in my head but I could never do in the camera. And um, so from talking to her and from learning a bit, I kind of realized that you know, I could be artistic in a way that didn't require me having to paint or draw. Um, and so photography for me was a way of being able to document my travels but also be creative at the same time from early on and I don't know whether it was something that was in my head or if I just seen other people's work that I really liked um, you know and this is like 25 years ago um, and I think I just saw people's photography that I loved but I I couldn't create it myself and it wasn't until I worked out the right combination of lenses and camera uh, and lighting that I started to be able to create the things that I wanted to create um, and then through that, I started to be able to get the visions I had in my head out into the real world. It took quite a while for me to kind of get my feet in, in, the, in the photography world and to feel like I wanted to invest money in this. Um, and I think what was happening was I was traveling quite a lot. And so I just had a, uh, a like a Canon 300, I think, or 350, which is like a 35 millimeter camera. Um, and I bought a 50 mil 1.8 lens and it's called the plastic fantastic it's like 150 bucks but it has a 1.8 aperture so your depth of field is really really short and that's when I when I put that on and took a photo at 1.8 I was like oh my god you know the background was creamy the subject was just in focus and then everything else was blurring and that's when I kind of was like this is the light bulb moment this is when I'm seeing the things in my head come out in the real world um, and so through that travel, um, I started to kind of get a better eye. I think I kind of got, got more practice at shooting, started to learn what I liked to shoot and what I didn't like to shoot. Um, and it wasn't until maybe 10, 15 years ago that I decided that I wanted to sort of start doing more studio work. So up until this point, it was all natural light. It was all kind of landscapes or travel photography. So once I started getting into the lighting situation um, and investing in some some strobes um, that's when the more cinematic work that i wanted to do sort of started to come out and i am not somebody who invests money in hobbies very often so it took quite a while for me to be able to to pluck up the courage to spend this kind of money on on strobes and that sort of stuff and so i went with the things that were the smallest and the lightest um, so I could travel with them, so I could go wherever I needed to. And so it was the Canon 580EX strobes on camera flash um, that I then you know, would take off the camera and, and start lighting from the sides. And once that sort of happened, um, the whole world kind of opened up for me. It was, funnily enough, the first kind of real gig that I had where I kind of felt like I was starting to become a professional photographer was a friend's wedding. Um, they asked me to shoot it uh, and it was a lot of fun and I had a lot, of, um, a lot of creative moments when I was doing it. And the images that came out the other end, you know, and they were happy, I was happy, but it was this case of, oh, you know what, I think I could probably do this as a job, you know. And at this point I'm working in IT you know, I'm a programmer, I've got a nine to five desk job, um, and then on the weekends I'm out shooting weddings and all this sort of stuff. And that's when 
things started to transition. I was caring more about the weekend work than I was about the career. And so things started to shift. I would start to spend more money on, on gear and equipment, um, spending more time learning stuff on YouTube and um, other websites. And it was then that I kind of realized that that's where my passion lay. And I'm always someone who will go after the passion rather than the paycheck. So whilst I wasn't making a whole lot of money, I was living and surviving, but I was happy. The step into the underwater world was, uh, again, it was kind of an experiment. It was just something that kind of happened by accident. Um, at this stage in my career, I was shooting commercial work. I was doing advertising and, and fashion work back in New Zealand where I was living. Um, and it's a small market. There's a lot of photographers vying for the same work. And I was looking for something that was um, going to separate me from everyone else. And I found an old underwater camera that I used to take diving. And I've been diving since I was 16. So the water is my happy place. And so I decided to take this camera underwater. I got a friend, we went to the local swimming pool um, and we just sort of played around. And coming out of that, like the photos were terrible, but it was a proof of concept. I went, I realized that I could do this, that this had some potential. Um, and so that's when I invested in a, a housing for my camera. Um, it was just a plastic bag, basically. Um, and I built some lighting because what I wanted to do was be able to take my studio work, my cinematic stuff, and take that underwater so that I could, you know, kind of replicate that. And there was no lighting that was going to do that for me out of the box. So I started building some housings for, for my little, you know, speed lights, um, fiber optic systems to kind of trigger them. Um, and that was when I started to feel like I was actually really creating something. Before that, before I jumped into the underwater world, I felt like I was just imitating other photographers. But when I got underwater, I felt like I actually found my own voice and I found my own style. So when I first started in underwater, it was a case of having to solve all these problems that really presented themselves because I'm trying to use the gear in a way that it wasn't really intended. I'm an underwater portrait photographer, I shoot people under the water, um, whereas all this gear is really designed for scuba divers taking pictures of wildlife, um, you know, macro photographers or wide angle photographers. They don't tend to really do much in between. So in terms of what I wanted to do, using their setups would make my clients and my subjects look very strange. Um, and so the first thing I needed to be able to do was, um, was build some lighting systems that would would work the way that I was using in my studio. Um, and I'm also someone who doesn't really like spending money on something if I'm not sure it's gonna work out. So uh, I like kind of MacGyvering things. So sort of, you know, um, holding things together with tape and, um, and string is kind of how I work to start with. Um, and in the early days, it was a case of being able to get the equipment that I already had above water equipment and take that underwater safely. Um, and so I had a, a Canon system that would use infrared to trigger all my lights in the studio. Um, underwater infrared doesn't work because it doesn't travel very far. And so these lights that I had, that I now made little housings for out of Pelican cases, you know, I needed a way to trigger them. And so I ended up building a system of fiber optic that could take that infrared system, that infrared light and send it out to all those flashes. Um, and so that, getting that to work was kind of a, um, a beachhead moment, I think, where I was like, okay, this, this is going to work. Like, this is cool. Um, and so I started being able to capture the images that I wanted to capture. And I started to kind of get excited about this whole creative side of things. Um, to the point where I then started being able to get paid clients with this Frankenstein system that I'd made. Um, the images that were coming out of there are still some of my most favorite images. And what it meant was that I could then uh, invest some of that money in getting better gear. So then I invested in, you know, actual underwater lights, strobes, um, cabling systems, and, and eventually an actual underwater housing um, for scuba diving and all that sort of stuff. So the the joy of shooting underwater for me is actually the solving of the problem as much as the taking of the image. 
So when you're an underwater photographer, you can't just go and rent a studio, you know. Uh, I was traveling quite a lot, and what I like to do when I travel is, is have it pay for itself. So if I'm traveling to Europe, I want to be able to set up shoots there and have, you know, that kind of pay for the trip to be there. But unfortunately, I can't go and rent a studio. I have to rent a pool somewhere. Um, and a lot of that was either Airbnb or diving pools or public swimming pools, and they're all a variety of of qualities you know you never know what you're going to get until you turn up and it could be beautiful or it could be just absolute garbage so i always dreamt of having my own space um, and what i also wanted to do as well was as i was going through this and this is probably like six years of, of renting pools from other places i i had all these big ideas that i wanted to do you know i wanted to build sets under the water i wanted to play with props under the water i wanted to do complicated lighting setups um, but when you're renting a pool by the hour, you don't have a lot of time to kind of mess around. So um, we ended up buying a property here in Long Beach um, about three and a half years ago. And the backyard is massive. And as soon as I saw it, I had told my wife we were putting a pool in. And so that process was, was amazing because I got to, to build a swimming pool like I would build a photo studio. So it's pure white, it's got a psych wall, all the edges are curved. Um, the way it's set up for lighting is perfect for me. It's got different areas that you can shoot in. Um, and being able to have that space that is just at my back door means that I can experiment and play with all these things that I always wanted to try. One of my most favorite shoots in the swimming pool or in my studio um, was actually one of the first sets that I built in there. And it was for a band called Wise Blood, uh, who are from LA, and they wanted to do this cover shoot. And the singer, uh, Natalie, she wanted it to look like her bedroom from the 80s when she was growing up, but she wanted it underwater. And so we ended up building this, you know, three wall and a floor kind of set. Um, lots of goodwill furniture. We had a bed in there, a dresser, there was a computer, the fan, um, stereo all these sorts of details, clothes everywhere. And it was just a, a surreal experience because once we started to dress the set underwater, you know, carry these things under, the world just sort of changed. And as we're under there and we're actually making the bed under there, me and my safety diver, Ryan, are just looking at each other going, we're making a bed like nine feet underwater. This is the weirdest thing we've ever done. And just having to do all that, um, was surreal and it just really reinforced my love for this world. It's, it's, it's the thing that dreams are made of. It's so surreal. Um, but this ended up being their album cover and it went, went viral. It was like, I'm still seeing it, and this was three years ago, I'm still seeing it um, pop up in people's Instagram feeds and getting tagged in it every other week. Uh, it was just, um, just again, a, a life-changing kind of concept. One of the hardest things to deal with when you shoot underwater is, is to get across the idea that this is actually underwater. Once I started getting into building sets and using props, it looks like a normal room, but there's, you know, there's someone floating in the middle of it. Um, and people today are so uh, desensitized by this, they just automatically think it's Photoshop. Whereas for me, I have this real obsession with getting stuff right in camera. So using the underwater to be able to let someone float in a room with a TV on and a couch, you know, for me, that's the magic. But what I forget is when I show those images to people, they are like, oh, that's cool. Not realizing that it was all done practically underwater. Um, and so getting that across is, is kind of a bit of a, a dogma that I have. I have to make sure that what I'm shooting has a reason for being underwater. Because if it could be Photoshop, then why go to all the effort? So for me, you know, I do some self-portraits of myself in the pool, in a set, which I'm so proud of because having the camera on a self-timer and then getting myself in the right position and not having any Photoshop involved just makes me feel so, like, so proud of this image. One of the other cool images that I did um, was using forced perspective. So I had a mermaid at the end of the pool um, and she had this concept where she wanted to look like she was inside a plastic bottle, kind of an environmental theme. Um, and so rather than 
photoshopping the bottle in over the top of her, I got a clear plastic bottle and I just floated it in front of the camera lens. And then she's, you know, 20 feet behind it. And so as they is floating, I'm just kind of moving the camera around to get her right in the right spot. And that photo for me is, is again, one of the proudest moments because it worked. There's no Photoshop or tr trickery or anything. It's just one image captured at the right time. So I kind of had a, a run over the last couple of years of, of trying to top myself with the sets that I was building. Um, so after the Wise Blood set, we had that 80s bedroom, and then I built a, um, a Baroque kind of living room. Um, so it was, uh, had this amazing Baroque furniture and stuff in there, uh, and it was really cool. But I think my Halloween set from a couple of years ago was kind of, in terms of over the topness, was, was kind of one of my favorites. Uh, it was a homage to um, horror films. So we kind of added like some things from It and Stephen King and The Shining, um, Freddy Krueger, all these sort of props in there, but it was basically someone's TV room. And so I had a TV that I'd got and gutted and put a light inside so it looked like the TV was on. Uh, we had a couch, you know, there's red balloons kind of floating everywhere, but the, the kind of the dark horse of the whole thing was this police tape that I got, like crime scene tape. I thought it would just kind of sink to the bottom and kind of float around, but it actually kind of held its shape and it was doing these big kind of swoops through the room so that when my, my clients were in there, my models, they would kind of have to navigate swooping through all this police tape. Um, and the TV on the on underwater was kind of this amazing moment because people were so blown away by it. Like, how did you have a TV on nine feet under the water? And that and that for me was kind of the payoff was seeing their kind of their eyes light up. So with these things, like there is always the, a lot of things can go wrong when you're underwater. So shooting underwater takes three to four times longer than shooting on land, and it things are going to go wrong three to four times more often. Um, and recently we were shooting a music video in here for an electronic artist and the director wanted to kind of have this sort of hotel room furniture in the bottom there um, and they wanted a rug like an old 70s rug on the ground that all the furniture sat on so the uh, the production designer brought this rug in and I had turned my back but the the crew were actually putting the rug in the water before I checked it and as soon as it hit the water yellow color was coming out of this thing so our pool was starting to turn turn bright yellow and I was like get it out get it out get it out and we pulled it out but it was, by then it was too late um, so it was potentially a disaster but luckily the director was standing there and he's like you know what I kind of like that color of the water that's kind of what the color would be in post anyway so I think it's perfect so we kind of saved it by having this color come through but we have things like that all the time where you'll, you'll put a couch in there that you think is clean, but then, you know, 40 years worth of crap starts floating out of it over the next couple of hours and it kind of falls apart. Uh, and even in the Wise Blood um, cover shoot, we had a dresser that was in there, but it was made of particle board. And through the photos, and you can see it on the album cover, everything's starting to melt and sink and break apart. You know, when I first got into shooting underwater, it was, uh, it was very exciting and I was kind of very excited by the work I was doing. But I, I think the more I got into it, the more I wanted to see what other people were doing. And the more you look, the more you kind of found people. Um, you know, there's some really big sort of names in the underwater world of um, Zena Holloway and, um, and other people like that who do a lot of commercial work. But there was so many more people doing the underwater portraiture work the more I look for them, the more I would find them. And I felt like we were a community that wasn't really getting much support. Um, we usually get tacked on to the diving side of things. So any competitions that are out there are generally like one category in a, you know, in a wildlife competition. Um, any resources we were out there finding were all targeted towards scuba divers. And so what I wanted to do was kind of get to know all these people and kind of bring them all together somehow. Um, and what I did last year, just as the pandemic started, was I started a podcast. Um, purely selfish reasons, I wanted to talk to all these people and kind of learn from them and, and get to know them and kind of work out you know, how they do what they do and why they do what they do. 
And so through that podcast of doing interviews uh, every week with a different underwater creative, um, was I got to know lots of people in the industry from all over the world. Um, you know, cinematographers in India, um, um, underwater photographers in Australia and Canada, you know, safety people, um, lighting people, costume designers, all that sort of stuff. And what I found was that there's not a lot of things that bring us together. And so kind of my journey of this last year has been setting up a bit of a community. Um, the podcast has been really good. Um, I started a magazine earlier this year called Waterproof, um, which showcases a lot of um, established people's work in the underwater portrait world, but also people who are up and coming and, and sort of evolving themselves. So it's nice to be able to give them an outlet to get, you know, so we can all see each other's work, but also that other people can see their work as well. The other kind of thing that I like to do is that I've spent eight, nearly 10 years learning how to do all this underwater stuff. And for a lot of people, it's a black box. You know, I have clients who come to me and want a music video shot and all they think is that it's, you know, this is, we'll just stick someone in the water and we'll shoot it and that's it. But there's a whole myriad of things that need to be done and thought of before we could even shoot this. So what I want to do and what I like doing is, is sharing that knowledge that I've learned, you know, sort of cutting the corners for some of these people so that they don't go down the same, make the same mistakes that I did, you know, learn from, from how other people have been doing it. So I do a lot of online mentoring, which was really good during the pandemic. You know, we couldn't meet in person, but we could do stuff through via Zoom, um, upskilling people, um, just solving some problems for them that were stopping them from being as creative as they could be. So for me, there is a whole community of people that I'm yet to meet, but who I, I want to help to be as creative as they can be. I think the best bit of advice that I can give someone getting into the underwater world now is, is don't feel like you need to spend a whole lot of money. You know, you can use the equipment that you've already got and just kind of get the housings that will fit it. You know, I started trying to use all the equipment that I had that was non-waterproof and I just made ways for it to work. You know, you don't feel like you need to have to invest in the, in the most expensive housing if it's, this is something that you're going to do maybe once or twice a month. You just need something that is going to help you to get the creative side of what you need out. You don't need to invest in the technical side of it straight away. If a GoPro is what you have, shoot some awesome stuff with a GoPro. Learn what that GoPro can teach you until you've outgrown it and then get the next thing.